Good morning, everybody. This is a new colloquia by, under the Severo Ochoa program here at the IAA, Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia. And today we will have the talk by uh, Dr. John Stansberry from the Space Telescope Science Institute. And he will talk about the James Webb Space Telescope, specifically on planets and exoplanets. Uh, Dr. Isabel Marquez will uh, introduce uh, John properly. Isabel? Good morning, everyone. Thanks. Oh, good afternoon, <laughs> whatever. Uh, uh, thank you again for being here to, uh, in, in this um, Severo Ochoa Colloquium. Um, it's a pleasure for us to have here Professor John Stans Stansbury. Uh, thank you very much, John, for, for accepting an invitation and um, that, that I uh, take profit to extend to an in-person one in future when possible once, for instance, the James Webb uh, Telescope will be launched. Uh, Professor John Stansbury earned his PhD in planetary sciences at the University of Arizona in Tucson in the United States in 1994 uh, with modeling of surface atmosphere uh, uh, interactions of Pluto and Triton. He then transitioned into infrared observation and astronomy in 1999 to work on NASA's Spitzer Space uh, Telescope. In 2005, he started working part-time for the instrument uh, team of the James Webb Space Telescope's uh, near-infrared camera at Newcomb. And then after Spitzer Randall of, of, of Cryogen, he transitioned uh, to working on uh, Newcomb full-time since 2008. He currently works at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore in Maryland in the United States as an instrument scientist, leading the effort to commission the Newcomb uh, instrument and the observatory's moving target observing facility capabilities. Um, his research activity was devoted to first studying volcanism on Jupiter's moon, Io, and later into using the Spitzer and Herschel space observatories to measure albedos and sizes of trans-Neptunian uh, objects by measuring their thermal emission. Uh, today, as you know, we will talk about the James Webb Space Telescope capabilities for planets and exoplanets observations. So uh, thank you very much again, uh, John, um, and welcome. So that's your, your turn now. Thank you very much. Okay, shall I, I'll share my screen. Okay, that's the correct slide. Um, Thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. Um, it's a pleasure. I visited Granada some years ago and um, liked it very much and work with several people there fairly closely. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have a chance to speak to you and tell you a little bit about James Webb and where the project is and what it can do. Um, so uh, JWST is a multi national consortium. Um, it's led out of NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, but it has a very large ESA con contribution in terms of two instruments and the launch vehicle. Uh, prime contractor is Northrop Grumman in Los Angeles. Um, it's got four science instruments, the near infrared camera, near cam, which I'm a part of that team, uh, the near infrared spectrograph, near spec, which is an ESA contribution. Those are both operate between about 0.6 and 5 microns. Uh, the mid-infrared instrument, is, MIRI, is uh, between 5 and 30 microns and combines imaging and coronography and spectroscopy. Um, and then uh, the fine guidance sensor was uh, supplied by the Canadian Space Agency and also comes with an instrument. I'm not sure. I've never noticed it wasn't listed here. <laughs> uh, the nearest instrument is a part of that same uh, instrument package, also su supplied by uh, CSA. And the Science Operations Center is here at Space Telescope Institute in Baltimore. Um, it's a large space based uh, telescope with a six and a half meter uh, segmented primary. Uh, low temperature operations for the instruments and the um, primary mirror is also passively cooled. It's not um, nearly as cold as Spitzer or Herschel, but um, it is uh, fairly cool. Um, it'll be launched on the last Ariane 5 rocket uh, to an L2 orbit uh, in October of this year. And it's got a five-year mission 
goal, you know, five, five year mission uh, requirement with a 10 year goal. And it's got, um, let's see, I'm trying to figure out how to get rid of the little, there we go, um, four science themes. Um, the first is uh, cosmological in nature, basically um, the beginnings of the universe, assembly of galaxies, um, the births of stars and planets and the planetary systems and origins of life. And so the instrumentation and the observatory are configured to try and address all four of those science themes rather thoroughly. Um, okay, so I wanted to just um, spend probably the first 15 minutes or 20 minutes just saying a little bit about the instruments, sensitivity, and some operational uh, restrictions. Um, this is a quick overview of the four instruments, uh, which I mentioned earlier, NIRCAM, NIRIS, NIRSPEC, and MIRI. Um, and the uh, modes that are probably most interesting for uh, planetary and exoplanetary observations are highlighted in red. And as you can see, um, almost everything is red on this chart. So. Um, there's NIRCAM provides imaging, coronography, and uh, both imaging and GRISM time series capabilities. NIRIS uh, provides uh, low resolution slitless spectroscopy modes and an aperture masking interfer interferometric mode um, that are quite interesting for um, both transits and high resolution imaging. Uh, near spec uh, has a variety of dispersions and uh, it has a, a imaging spectrometer an integral field unit or IFU with a three arc second square field of view and also fixed slits uh, one of which which is fairly large 1.6 arc second slit that is of interest for transits um, and then it has a multi shutter array and they uh, we've got a one configuration that um, creates a long slit in that multi shutter array so that could be useful for things like cometary um, spectroscopy. And then Miri is the uh, longer wavelength instrument goes out from five to 28 microns and it offers imaging also I have used spectroscopy and approximately a four by four arc second field of view and uh, fixed slit low resolution spectroscopy or slitless. Um, and so that, <clears throat> that mode is also of interest for the um, transiting exoplanets community. Um, so it's a fairly, uh, these are fairly co complex instruments. Um, planning observations is also uh, fairly complex. There's a fairly steep learning curve. Um, so if you haven't applied and you're interested in applying a plan to plan to spend some time learning how to how the instruments work and how you may want to use them. Um, this is uh, just a few charts that are sort of over of overview of the wavelength coverage and the types of uh, observations you can obtain. So it's the same four instruments in a graphical sense. So uh, in the top is the imaging and the lower panel is spectroscopy. Um, so the near cam instrument actually offers simultaneous imaging in two bands, the short wave band that goes from about 0.7 to 2.3 microns and a live long wave band that goes from 2.5 to 5 microns. And you can do either coronography or uh, standard imaging over that um, entire wavelength range. Um, and then the nearest instrument is also an imager mostly. Um, but does have some spectroscopic capabilities. My mouse keeps disappearing. <laughs> um, and then uh, MIRI also offers imaging and coronography, and so its wavelength coverage is indicated up here. And then for spectroscopy, there's the um, near spec, which uh, offers both multi object, single slit, and the IFU capabilities. Um, and then NIRIS and NIRCAM offer slitless capabilities in complementary wavelength ranges. So NIRIS offers the capability at shorter wavelengths. NIRCAM offers that capability at longer wavelengths. And then um, MIRI includes, uh, actually uh, includes a slitless mode as well. So this lower slitless bar should encompass MIRI as well. I didn't realize that. Um, 
and then it it has a slit and also it has the imaging uh, spectroscopy mode the IFU mode um, so the, a, a little bit more detail about the imaging so this is showing uh, for standard imaging and coronography and the um, the three instruments that have that um, it's illustrating the rough field of view for each instrument. So for near cam um, standard imaging mode, you have a, up to a 2.2 by 4.4 arc minute field of view. Um, coronography, you have a field of view that's about 20 arc seconds squared. And you can do that uh, across the entire wave, wavelength range of near cam. And again, you get two, two filters simultaneously. Um, Miri has a <clears throat> about a quarter of the field of view of near cam, so about 1.2 by two arc minutes in imaging mode, and a <clears throat> similar field of view for coronography, about 20 to 30 arc seconds squared, um, depending on wavelength. And then uh, Neris has uh, half the field of view of near cam, so two, two by two arc minutes. Um, and uh, in a single detector, I guess the other thing I didn't point out here is the, the pixel scales for the instruments. So for near cam in the shortwave channel, the pixel scale is actually uh, 31 milli arc seconds. And in the long wave channel, it's actually 63 milli arc seconds. And for MIRI, it's a, uh, 110 milli arc seconds. And for nearest, the pixel scale is 65 milli arc seconds. And then this um, darker blue band for near us here is showing where they have the uh, aperture masking um, high resolution imaging capability that I'll describe a little bit more later. Um, this is similar for the spectroscopic modes. And so this is giving um, the type of spectroscopy, um, multi object integral field unit or imaging spectroscopy slit and slitless. And then it's giving the um, field of view is shown by the um, rectangular regions. And then the resolution is listed um, for each of these types of spectroscopy. And the, the field of view is um, also given numerically here. So there's a lot of information packed into these, but near spec you can see offers three different res uh, resolving powers of 100, 1000 and about 2700. Um, and then it has the multi, the multi object um, capability, um, the integral field unit, and then a, a range of slit sizes. And this square one, the 1.6 by 1.6, is the one that's probably mostly in, of interest for transits. And then uh, the MIRI IFU has got um, it's rather complicated instrument, but it um, has four actual four separate um, IFU uh, slicers that have slightly different fields of view, but they overlap on sky. And so you get um, resolution resolving powers of about 3000 across that band, um, all the way from five to 28 microns. Um, and then uh, let's see the slit list for nearest and near cam is shown at the bottom. Um, so again, a low resolving power for nearest covering out to about 2.3 microns and medium res resolving power for near cam uh, out from 2.5 to five microns. So a lot of, a lot of choices of spectroscopic capabilities. Um, this is just to illustrate the wealth of filters that are available for the instrumentation. So NearCam has got 29 separate um, bands for imaging uh, that are illustrated here. And the, um, the, through, the filter band passes um, vary from the extremely broad. These are over 100% bandwidth, both of these. Um, and then there are the more standard wide filters, which are about 25% band pass. Medium are about 10% band pass and then narrow, which are a couple of percent band pass in most cases. And then the vertical bar here is where the <clears throat> there's a dichroic in the instrument. And so you get half the light goes into the short wavelength channel and you pick one filter from this side and the other half the light goes into the 
long wave channel, and you can pair that with a filter from the right half of the um, figure for simultaneous two, two color imaging. And then Neris has also got 12 filters. Um, 11, of them, 11 of them are actually copies of the near cam filters. They were flight spares due to a, a very late reconfiguration of the nearest instrument. Um, and then they have one unique filter, uh, 1.58 microns. Um, and it's a single uh, single detector with a 65 milli arc second pixel scale. Near cam, I didn't mention this, has got 10 2048 by 2048 detectors in it. So it um, generates data very quickly. Um, and also that's why it has a very significant field of view. Um, <clears throat> Mary has got nine filters for imaging and you get one filter at a time in a, that somewhat smaller field of view. Um, and then three filters for coronography. And these are <clears throat> actually, the filters are <clears throat> the filters are a part of the coronagraphic masks themselves. I'll show you a picture of what those look like a little later. But um, so there are four of these. Why did I say three? I can't count <laughs> four filters for coronography, um, uh, as shown here. Okay, so. Uh, one of the big benefits of having a giant mirror in space that's fairly cold is that you get a lot of sensitivity. Um, so this is uh, comparing the near cam uh, sensitivity and the MIRI sensitivity to previous missions, um, Hubble and Spitzer, um, uh, Herschel, all the Herschel wavelengths were off to the right on this plot. And uh, ISO was uh, considerably less sensitive, so it was off the top of this plot. Um, so you can see that um, JWST is going to be a lot more sensitive, roughly a factor of 10 or better, more sensitive than previous missions. Um, the reason it's not more sensitive at the longer wavelengths is because the primary mirror is going to operate at around um, 60 Kelvin, if I recall. And so there's quite a bit of background in the Miri, Miri bands out at these wavelengths. Otherwise, this curve would be much flatter. And then um, because of the detectors and the coatings used on JWST, the um, sensitivity at the shortest wavelengths is actually not that much better than, than Hubble. And at our shortest wavelength, that's essentially comparable to what Hubble, Hubble provided. But it's, it quickly gets, does get better than, than Hubble by a factor of two to, to many. Um, and simple, similarly for uh, spectroscopy, it's even more impressive. Um, this is the near spec. Uh, these are line, line emission uh, sensitivities. I didn't have the continuum sensitivity plot um, and compared to various ground-based uh, SOFIA. And there's not really other space-based uh, capabilities that are comparable anyway. Um, and then MIRI compared to Spitzer. So, uh, a spectroscopy machine, I think, is a good way to think of it. Um, it's going to be show, tell us a lot of stuff we didn't know about um, planets and exoplanets. Um, so JWST has got a field of regard that includes about 35% of the sky at any particular time. Um, it has a large sun shield, which is uh, the main component for the thermal control of the um, telescope and the instruments. And then the spacecraft bus is located on the sunward side of that sun shield. So you can, this can rotate uh, in 360 degrees around the spacecraft sun line. Uh, and so it can point at either of the ecliptic poles and then it can point within about 85 degrees of the sun and out to about 135 degrees from the sun. Um, and uh, it, you can imagine the primary pointing either into the page or out of the page. And as uh, the observatory orbits the sun, you're able to access any point um, on the sky that's within the field of regard twice a year and the two small continuous viewing zones at the north and south 
uh, ecliptic poles that are about a cone angle of five degrees. So this means <clears throat> for solar system objects, most of them, at least the ones that are near the ecliptic, uh, your observations are going to occur near quadrature, not at opposition. And this is um, same design as for um, Spitzer and Herschel um, and uh, I believe Planck. So it's a lot of these, uh, a lot of the modern observatories that aren't Earth orbiting are adopting this sort of a viewing geometry. Um, so there's uh, the observatory can only roll plus or minus five degrees about the um, boresight axis. Um, and uh, when you're on the ecliptic, that means that your entire range of available uh, position angles on sky is about plus or minus five degrees for any given object. Um, and as I mentioned on the previous slide, in a single year, you get two apparitions of any particular target. And so you have, in this case, there's an apparition beginning in 2019 and another one later in 2019. And then shortly later, you pick up the little bit of the next apparition that you didn't get at the beginning of the year. And these are spaced about um, five months apart and four months apart due to the um, fact that um, the solar elongation angle is not uh, evenly isn't centered on 90 degrees from the sun. It's 85 to 135. So you get a you get a long gap, and then you get a short gap, and then you get a long gap, and then a short gap, and then each of these um, apparitions is about um, uh, 50 days long. Uh, if, if you go away from the ecliptic, these get longer, and when you get to the ecliptic pole, you have continuous coverage with much wider. Uh, available position angles for the instruments. Um, so NearSpec is a powerful spectrometer, uh, incredibly sensitive with a lot of flexibility in terms of resolving power. But um, one of the drawbacks is the small size of the apertures. And so the, the imaging spectrometer, the IFU is three arc seconds squared. <clears throat> the slitless or the um, the the large fixed slit aperture is only 1.6 arc seconds squared, and it's also used for target acquisition if you need to do a target acquisition. And so, for moving targets, this means that you really need to know the ephemeris of your target very well, and either either to put it into one of these apertures for blind pointing, or to do target acquisition. Um, you if you wanted to accurately position your target in the IFU, for instance, you would first have to do target acquisition within this 1.6 arc second fixed slit. Um, so one of the challenges for solar system astronomy is going to be um, making sure that we know the ephemerities of the moving targets well enough that we can actually do them. And then this is showing notionally the long slit that's in one of the micro shutter array quadrants. And, oh, another thing that's a, kind of interesting. So for the IFU, it's got um, uh, 30 slitlets and the spectra from those are distributed as shown by these little blue dashed things. And so you can imagine for slitlet number one, um, it's positioned this way vertically on the detector array. And then the spectrum would go um, this direction. And so if you've got, um, the micro shutter arrays are pretty dark, pretty opaque, but they're not perfectly opaque and they do have some failed open shutters. And so when you take IFU spectro spectroscopic data, if you have a bright object somewhere in the micro shutter arrays, um, that could result in some contamination of your spectrum. Um, so the coronagraphic modes uh, in Near Cam and Mary are going to be, uh, they don't, well, especially for Near Cam, the inner working angle isn't spectacular. Um, it's only about a half an arc second. And I won't get into why that is, but um, the, um, the, the 
contrast that you, we expect to be able to achieve is significantly better than uh, at these wavelengths than you're able to do from the ground. And so that's uh, where, where we expect to win. Um, and this is just comparing those contrasts to various size exoplanets at various separations. And then this is showing the layout of the coronagraph uh, in near cam. There are five occulting uh, masks. Um, there are three spot masks that, and two bar masks that are apodized. And um, then various, these are neutral density squares that are used for target acquisition of very bright targets. Um, and then you can also do target acquisition on fainter targets. There are other um, acquisition regions in between the neutral density spots that you can also use for acquiring fainter targets. But you've got a range of um, occulters that are matched um, to the filters, uh, to the 210, 335, and 430 filter. And then the shortwave bar, depending on what filter you choose, the target is placed at various, various places along the bar, depending on the width of the bar, and the same way for the long wave bar occulter. So MIRI is, um, there's not really any comparable capability at MIRI wavelengths um, to compare it to. So there's a lot, uh, a fairly large discovery space here probably. Um, again, this is comparing contrasts and the, um, at the different MIRI wavelengths um, to the expected uh, contrast for a range of uh, planets. And these are um, these are four quadrant phase masks. Um, so they are much higher performance uh, occulter in terms of the inner working angle. So you can see that Mary is getting down to about um, a third of an arc second inner working angle, even though the wavelengths are eleven microns and uh, longer. So um, these are much more. Um, aggressive style of a coronagraph and this is just showing um, how they how they're laid out in the hardware um, and, and there's one spot occulter that's a fairly large spot that you can use with any of the usual imaging filters <clears throat> um, nearest includes uh, interesting aperture masking interferometry mode or ami um, so it's uh, got uh, seven, seven uh, sub-apertures. This is showing the uh, segment pattern for the primary mirror of JWST. And then for uh, seven of those uh, segments, there's a sub-aperture cut out of this mask that provides these different um, interfer interferometric baselines, 21 of them. Um, and the advantage of doing this is that you get uh, Michelson resolution rather than the usual um, uh, usual resolution. And so you get lambda over 2D spatial resolution instead of uh, a little bit worse than lambda over D. Um, so this will deliver a stable PSF that's 60 to 80 milliarc seconds, um, depending on wavelength. And you can pair that with these these filters in the filter wheel. Um, the price you pay is that the throughput is reduced by a, a factor of about five relative to the full telescope aperture. And this is just showing a, a model, um, in this case for IO with a disc and four infrared sources on it, representing volcanoes. And then um, a straight uh, PSF from the AMI mode um, convolved with the model and then uh, processed uh, to pull out the, uh, the sources, the volcanic sources. And you can see the two brighter ones rather easily. And in the final product here, you can see at least the, the third one uh, fairly clearly. Obviously you'd wanna take a series of images and do dithering and stuff to really pull that out, but um, pretty interesting and unusual um, instrument capability. Oh. Uh, 
So <laughs> there was supposed to be some text here, but I forgot uh, to move that over from another slide. So for time series, the basically uh, a lot of the basic instrument modes that I've already described can be used for uh, time series observations. The only real adaptation that we figured out we needed to make was um, James Webb needs to be able to repoint its high gain antenna every um, roughly every 10,000 seconds, three hours or so. Um, and that's because it's a fairly um, tight, uh, fairly tight uh, antenna pattern. And so it needs to be kept pointed at Earth. And normally the observatory does that in between observations. Um, so if you do an imaging observation and then there's a break and the antenna is predicted to be need to be pointed before the next observation would complete, it will get repointed and then the next observation would start. Um, so it, the antenna moves occur between between observations. For time series, especially for transits, transiting exoplanets, um, three hours isn't long enough. And so uh, the adaptation we made is that uh, observations can continue while the high gain antenna is repointed. And that's expected to cause a brief period of jitter um, due to the mechanical disturbance of the, the antenna motion, um, probably less than about a minute and not um, particularly uh, large oscillations of the target, you know, target on the detector, but there will be noticeable um, and much higher jitter than normal for that brief period. But you can keep your time series um, data acquisition going. Um, and right now, the maximum allowed duration for time series is 48 hours. So that probably encompasses nearly every science case that people can come up with. OK, so um, I want to switch a little bit from the um, kind of the capabilities and limitations of the observatory to what uh, sorts of programs people have um, submitted and got, gotten approved now um, for using JWST. Uh, and I, um, I'll go through these. Um, there's three early release science programs, uh, or ERS. Um, there are a fairly large number of guaranteed time observer programs. These are programs by the instrument PIs and their science teams. Um, and then uh, cycle one general observer programs were just announced last week. So I'll say a little bit about those as well. Um, so the ERS program that was approved is for uh, the Jovian system. And it's prox the PI is Imke de Potter and Thierry Fouché. Uh, is the uh, ESA PI. Uh, it's about 30 hours of uh, total time, uses all four JWST instruments, um, Mirian near spec, uh, IFU uh, spectroscopy, near cam imaging, and nearest masking, uh, aperture masking interferometry. Um, and uh, they'll study reflected and thermal emission spectra for the satellites, uh, both illuminated and, and in eclipse. Um, and Jovian full disk and South Pole and ring imaging and also uh, spectroscopy. Um, and then the aperture masking uh, interferometric met, uh, imaging for uh, IO. And that's also uh, in eclipse and sunlight. So this is just sort of showing uh, where the near cam imaging will occur, basically the full disk of Saturn and a uh, fairly extensive ring study. Um, the nearest interferometry mode is the mapping volcanoes on Io's disk. Uh, near spec IFU spectroscopy of the Jovian South Pole, um, the Great Red Spot, and also of Io's full disk, and uh, also Miria IFU spectroscopy of Io, um, Ganymede, and the Jovian South Pole. So, a fairly uh, extensive reconnaissance of the Jovian system exercising a lot of the instrument modes on a, one of the most challenging targets in the solar system in terms of its brightness. Um, 
This is just showing an example of what the near spec IFU can do for an object like Ganymede. Um, so this is showing the um, the spaxels for the near spec IFU uh, compared to the disk of Ganymede. And then for each spaxel, you get a reflectance spectrum. Um, and that can be uh, of rather high resolution, up to almost 3,000 resolving power. And so you can do uh, pretty interesting stuff in terms of um, resolving em emission lines and things like that. And do so in a, um, an imaging spectroscopy uh, manner. So a very powerful tool for um, objects that are resolved like these moons of Jupiter. Um, Yeah, and th that'll also be done for IO as well, so that you can study SO2, uh, ozone, all sorts of compounds on um, water, bay water bands, um, all sorts of stuff that you can study that way. Okay, so there are two um, exoplanet ERS programs. The first is uh, transiting exoplanets, um, and the PI is Natalie Batala. Um, it's about 80 hours total. Uh, spread over three targets, um, uses the time series spectroscopic modes, um, the nearest um, single object slitless spectro spectroscopy, MIRI low resolution spectroscopy, near spec <clears throat> in both low and high resolution modes, and um, near cam long wave GRISM time series as well. Um, so you can see the targets that were um, chosen for the ERS program and the time uh, dedicated for each in sort of the, um, the basic science concept for, so transmission spectroscopy for WASP 79B, a MIRI thermal phase curve for WASP 43B, and a bright star um, test. This is to probe the, um, that sort of the noise floor um, that you can achieve with the instruments for WASP 18B. And then there's also a high contrast uh, exoplanets uh, ERS program. Uh, Sasha Hinckley is the PI. It's 55 hours distributed over four targets, it includes coronography, the AMI mode, and spectroscopy. And it's laid out, sort of laid out here, here, and also within the table. Um, and then uh, the four targets that they chose are listed here as well, and the specifics of their observations. <clears throat> okay, yeah, uh, and then I wanted to switch over to the guaranteed time solar system programs. So these are programs that were for the instrument PIs and their science teams. Um, and so there's quite a few of those. Uh, this is for, this chart is just for um, observations of Kuiper belt objects and their relatives. <coughs> um, so those include Pluto and Charon, uh, several of the Hal Halmea collisional family members, uh, a list of some of the very large but low albedo um, Kuiper belt objects. These are large enough that they could retain volatile ices and, and therefore have high albedos like Pluto, uh, but they don't. And also uh, observations of near spec. Um, and then uh, the near spec team has got uh, two medium sized uh, Kuiper belt objects and exercising two of the near spec uh, observing modes. Pablo Santos Sanz has got a, uh, it's a target of opportunity for a TNO occultation using NIRCAM. Um, Alex Parker, uh, another cup, uh, pair of large uh, Kuiper Belt objects um, using MIRI and NIRSPEC, just do a fairly thorough study of those. Uh, Dean Hines, uh, a short list of um, Triton, which is thought to be a ki captured Kuiper Belt object, and then um, a large Centaur object and Sedna. Oh, I got Miri is in here, Triton is in here for twice for some reason. Um, 
And then uh, Jonathan Lunin, another um, set of large Kuiper belt objects and centaur objects. So this is for the Kuiper belt, it's approximately 75 hours total. And you can see that it's <clears throat> split over the near cam, near spec and the Hamill uh, interdisciplinary scientist and the Lunin interdisciplinary scientist um, time, time allocations. Oh, and I should point out these um, observing programs can all be found. Uh, the GTO programs are at this final URL, but if you just go to the observing programs part of this URL, um, you can get access to information about all of these, um, all of the approved programs, including the um, the observation planning files for APT and a summary of the planned observations in a PDF. Um, there's also comets and asteroids. This is about 60 hours total, and these are all from Heidi Hamill's um, inter interdisciplinary scientist um, uh, GTO pot. Um, and she was kind enough to say that there would be zero proprietary period on all these observations from hers. Um, and so these data will be available essentially as soon as they're processed through the pipeline in the archive. So there's a program for near Earth objects, large asteroids and Trojans, uh, the first by Christina Thomas, second by Andy Ritkin, um, Jupiter family comet program uh, by Mike Kelly at the University of Maryland, and then a, another uh, target of opportunity comet by Stephanie Milam at Goddard. And then also some programs for the planets and moons. So there's a Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune programs. Um, you sort of a pattern here. Those are all have the P same PI, which is Lee Fletcher uh, in the UK. Um, and then there's a Mars program, Geronimo Villanueva, uh, Europa Enceladus, uh, Plumes observations also by Geronimo, and then a program of Titan. Uh, on Titan by Connor Nixon. Um, so the GTO exoplanet programs, there's quite a few more. Um, so I didn't try to go through and say in any detail what the um, targets and modes were really, um, but I point out that these are, are available at the, um, the URL at the bottom of the page. So this is just showing in two charts what those programs are and people can look through that if they wish to after the talk. <clears throat> so that's the, that's the rest of the list. Okay, so um, cycle one general observer programs. Um, the call for proposal deadline was last November and the TAC has met and in late March, the full program announcement was made. I think it was maybe on April 2nd instead of late March. I forget the exact day. Um, and here we are at about uh, April 6th. And the HST cycle 29 deadline is Friday. Um, so these selections have been made and announced and then launch is uh, intended to be no later than the end of October this year. Um, launch opportunities start on the 1st of October this year. So that includes about a month of margin um, down at the launch center. And post-launch, there's a six month commissioning period. Uh, and then uh, cycle one science observations will begin at the end of commissioning. And this will probably, commissioning will probably sort of fade away and science will sort of fade in at this point, there will be some commissioning tasks that take a little longer, but time will start to become available and be used for doing uh, science as soon as we can start to do that. So these are the um, statistics for cycle one submissions. Um, there were about 1100 proposals, um, mostly in the small, the small category is less than 25 hours, medium is 25 to 75 and large is uh, over 75 hours requested. Um, and then this is showing, the pie chart is showing the distribution over the various um, science topics. Uh, so exoplanets and disks uh, went for 25%. That was about um, 
almost 50% higher than what they expected that fraction to be for cycle one. And so this slice of the pie it, uh, was much be bigger than they expected. And I think it's just because JWST has a lot of promise for doing um, exoplanet studies. Um, and then solar system came in at 6%. That's pretty good because um, Hubble, for instance, tends to run more around 3% per cycle. And so we, JWST attracted almost twice as many proposals as uh, Hubble typically has recently. And then there's some other slices of the pie here that um, I won't attempt to speak to because I don't know <laughs> anything about that. Um, another takeaway number was that the total oversubscription this cycle was only 4.3 to 1, um, which is pretty low for a brand new observatory. It may be that people wanted to hold off and see what it can do um, or that the learning curve was just too steep and they people didn't feel that they could write a good proposal uh, in the amount of time they left themselves. But, um, and then there's about 6,000 hours that'll be used for the general observer proposals in cycle one. And the rest will be GTO and calibration and ERS. Uh, this is the distribution of PIs uh, by country. Um, so Spain did pretty well, 24. Um, Iceland didn't do well, they had zero. Um, UK did very well. Um, so Europe as a whole, uh, I think did about um, a third of what the U US submitted. So pretty good, pretty good showing. I don't know um, success by country. I, I don't have numbers for that. Oh, one other aspect is over 30% of the PIs were fe are female. And so this is a, a metric that's been improving. Um, particularly uh, been improving over the years. And I, I think the uh, success rate of, of the female PIs uh, for selection is also improving as we come up with better ways to do reviews and things. Um, so this, of the selected programs uh, in exoplanets, uh, there were 70 programs selected. Um, with this distribution in terms of small, medium, and large. So mostly small, a few medium, and just one or two larges for 1,400 hours, or about 21 hours per program, typically. Um, it's pretty strongly dominated by time series studies, and about a quarter of it would be for coronography and direct imaging type studies. Solar system, about a third as many programs were selected, 18 small, three medium, and one large. Uh, for 360 hours, average of about 16 hours per program. So actually fairly comparable to the exoplanets program. The difference here is that for an exoplanet transit program where you're just staring at a target in one setting for many hours at a time, you're getting a lot of science, getting a lot of science time out of your 21 hours. For solar system, you're doing typically a lot of different instrument modes, um, dithering, uh, filter changes. And so the six, the amount of science time you're getting out of your 16 hours is relatively lower. Um, and the solar system was strongly dominated by small, small body studies. There was just one program selected for studying giant planets. And again, the URL where you can get information about all this is given at the bottom of the chart. Um, so these are the medium and large uh, solar system programs. There's a pencil beam survey, um, uh, volatiles on active centaurs, um, a large program by Noemi Benia Alonso for studying the composition of trans-Neptunian objects and a study for uh, Lucy mission targets by Mike Brown. Um, and then there are uh, just, yeah, so this, this is the exoplanet programs that are greater than 25 hours. Um, and I won't attempt to read this to you, but um, again, you can look at the charts afterwards or go to the website and get similar information presented there. Um, and there were, uh, let's see, one, I thought there was, I thought there was another large, oh yeah, there it is. Yeah, so there are two larges in here. Oops, sorry. Uh, this one by Kevin Stevenson 
and then another um, another very large one by Nat Natasha Batala. Okay, so where do we go from here? So this is back on the timeline. Here's launch, uh, October 2021 commissioning. Uh, L plus six is the uh, start of the cycle one science. The cycle two call for proposals <clears throat> is gonna be next summer, in the middle of next summer probably. Um, Oh, this is GTO, I'm sorry. This is for GTOs that wanna update their pro programs if they have any time that's not expended already. The GEO call for proposals will be um, next um, late summer. And then the cycle two uh, deadline proposals will be probably in December of next year. <clears throat> so a year and a half out for the next observing opportunity or proposing opportunity. And then the, the TAC would meet again fairly early in 2023. Um, and then cycle two starts um, late in 2023. Okay, so where are we at with James Webb? Uh, this is just some a few pictures to show you some of the hardware and progress on that. So this is all of the instruments in their um, fixture that is attached to the back of the uh, telescope. Um, the near spec is very large. Near cam is completely buried down inside here. Um, this MIRI label is in the wrong place. It should be over here. And the F FGS nearest instrument is also tucked away down in the middle there. Um, And this is the primary mirror after it was completed at Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, on the right is the ISOM instrument package being lowered down for integration onto the back of the um, telescope. Um, and you can see this is the secondary mirror st structure actually in its folded up configuration. It's got three, three arms. Um, that you can see here, the third one is folded back around the top of the observatory. It's the same, same as you see on here on the left. Um, there was a very uh, extensive and very expensive end-to-end -end cryovac optical test that was done down at NASA Johnson using an old Apollo uh, vacuum chamber. Uh, so this is, I like this picture because it gives you an idea of the scale of the primary and also an idea of the scale of the chamber. Um, but that, uh, that has been completed. It was a huge milestone and was triggered by the um, issue with the Hubble optics since that observatory never went through an end-to-end -end optical, optical test and only problems were only discovered after launch. Uh, the sun shield has been a, a very major technical challenge um, and that seems to have been completed successfully. They've deployed it and um, several times now. There's one more deployment, I think, of that before they go to the launch site. Um, and so that is done. Spacecraft bus is complete. This is just sort of showing a lot of the spacecraft bus is this um, mechanical structure that um, attaches to the um, telescope backplane and the tower um, and then interfaces all, all that to the uh, launch vehicle at the bottom. But then inside here, within the bays, um, there is room for all sorts of spacecraft electronics and power systems and reaction wheels and things like that. Um, so that's complete. And the spacecraft bus and the um, observatory uh, science segment have been integrated. And this is a picture from after the completion of the vibration and acoustic testing. So that's all done. And the post, um, post testing uh, aliveness has been completed as well. Um, and so we appear to be on track for transport to the Kuru Space Center in August of this year. And we can expect to be on sky doing science approximately one year from today. So I'll leave it here. Um, that's um, just a few links for some resources for the um, P2 
people that might want to think about uh, proposing for JWST if they haven't already done that. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for this talk. And now the talk is open for questions. Please uh, raise your hand for doing so. Go to the reaction button, button in the in the bottom of your, of your screen and raise your hand there. And I will uh, give you the permission to open the, your mic. So I can start with okay. one question that I have <clears throat> that I have uh, in one of uh, your slides in the GTO solar system program. Mm -hmm. You show some programs that uh, I'm really interested, like uh, the observation of Shariklo and uh, Chiron. Uh, with uh, Shariklo, with the IFU, so I think with that resolution, they can observe the ring. Uh, let's see. So this is uh, 100 milli arc second. Um, Yeah, 100 milli arc second spaxels. So I'm not sure, actually. Yeah, maybe it's in the limit, maybe. OK, I want to check with your first, one of your first slides showing the, the resolution of IFU. OK. OK, thank you. We have oh. another, another question here by Luisa Lara. OK. Please Hello, John. Nice talk. Uh, I, I, my question is related to the learning of the of the telescope and the instruments. Are the data to be acquired uh, aiming at scientific uh, return of the commissioning data, or is simply just validating the instrument, like we call active or passive checkout? So you're asking about the commissioning data specifically? Yes. Yes. Um, so mm -hmm. yes, if the scientific, uh, I mean, if this commissioning data will have a scientific value for for the community, or if they are going to be released after the, the instruments, uh, PIs, uh, okay. let's say validation. So I I believe it will be released. Um, targets we tried to pick targets that are not scientifically interesting. <laughs> so um, whether. But we may, we may have made a mistake and picked a picked a few targets that were interesting to somebody. Um, so it's definitely worth um, thinking about that. Um, what I don't I don't think we have is a comparable you know website like this one for the commissioning programs where people could look at the instrument modes and targets. So that's actually a good um, a good suggestion that I can follow up on. Um, and see if we could get something put together and just let the community know that the, you know, when the commissioning data will be available. It's, it's always a little bit sensitive because when you're just getting started, the data frequently doesn't look that good until you get things, you know, tuned up and working right. Um, so the PIs are sensitive about releasing data that is bad data. But I think by late commissioning, we should be taking data that's actually quite good. And so it, it could well be of interest to the science community. So I'll take that as yeah, a- Yeah, that's what I meant. I mean, after- Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Not the initial data that has have to be validated by the PIs and also if they are bad data. And right. they have to check the pipelines and so on. But maybe is the follow-up of this uh, commission you know, when they have, let's say, uh, tune the pipelines and, and getting really scientific valuable data later. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And I, so there are, a, a few, there are a couple of programs, like there's a program, a, at least two programs to show what sort of photometric stability or spectroscopic stability we get for transit studies. And those I think are targeting bin eclipsing binary stars with small, you know, small binary companion. Um, so fairly shallow events, but would be good for showing the type of precision that one could expect to achieve uh, early in the mission. And then there, there's also 
something similar for the cor coronagraphic modes to show um, what types of contrast we're actually achieving on those. And so there are some, there's also some early release observation programs that'll occur during commissioning. Those are different from the early release science um, and those data will be released to the community quite er early after the after those modes are, are done commissioning. Okay, thank you. Another question for John. I think everybody want to go to lunch. <laughs> I can't blame you. Okay, okay, I have one by Isabel. Yes. Okay. This is not a question, as you already know, <laughs> probably from other uh, colloquia. I, I, I'm, I'd like to end uh, just by saying thank you again to John and to uh, an, an, an extend in the invitation for a, an in-person one in, in the future when possible. Thank you very much for such a nice talk. Oh, thank you. I would love to come and visit. Okay, so I think, uh, Renee, you're going to post the slides online as well. And yeah, I, I will post the, the video online on YouTube. I will send you the link. And also, uh, to everybody, I have the talk on PDF. So if you, anyone wants it, can I send to them? Yeah. It's public? Yeah. Okay. So I can send to anyone that I, they can ask for that. Okay. Okay. And people are free to, you know, contact me with questions and stuff if they come up later or, or whatever. But I, I encourage everyone to try and apply for cycle two time. Um, it's quite a, quite an observatory and it's going to do a lot of great science. So. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you. OK.